So here we have David Platt and Francis Chan, two men who at one point in time were both regarded as two of the most prominent voices in Christianity, in a time when they were both considered biblical. Well, now they're basically both considered false teachers. And in a lot of ways, I'm still shocked about how it all fell apart. Francis Chan was one of the first preachers that when I first got saved, I was basically devouring all of his sermons that he preached at his Cornerstone Church from the early 2000s. I had a playlist that I would just, you know, go through and just play his sermons. He was one of the first pastors that I found when I removed myself from the uh, Word of Faith movement. And so it was shocking to me when he, when he fell away uh, and re basically revealed himself to be a false teacher. But I have been praying for Francis Chan, and I do hope that uh, he repents. Um, so And so here we have both men sitting down. It looks like they've become great friends. They're having a discussion. And I want to play this clip and basically interject my own opinion at points where things stick out and I feel need to be addressed. Francis, it's really good to be together, man. Yeah. It's, uh, I thank God for uh, bringing our paths across each other many years ago at Passion. And uh, it was right after Crazy Love had come out yes. and Radical. And I remember Heather read Crazy Love before I did, and she was like, did you, did you copy Francis's garden? <laughs> I was so, like, so no, I didn't, I didn't read it. But anyway, just kindred heart yeah. from the beginning. And, uh, and then fast forward to right now, I think I would say for both of us, um, there's a lot of, burdens on our heart and excitement mm -hmm. exhilaration really on our hearts for this time and place we're in so let me just ask you like what when it comes to things that are burdens on your heart or things that you are really uh exhilarated about uh yeah. in this time and place where's your mind gosh i think uh burden goes to division mm -hmm. in the church and uh, we're just kind of following the pattern of the world or maybe we set the pattern mm -hmm. in our devices mm -hmm. and just uh just a lot of fighting over things that aren't essential we're not giving each other the benefit of the doubt people are quick to leave churches and Okay, a couple of things of concern that stood out to me here. The first thing Francis reveals is, as he puts it, it's been a burden to him because of the division within the church. And then he goes on a joke and says, maybe we set the path for that division. Okay, now this burden that he's talking about, it's basically his conscience trying to grapple with the burden of basically being called out for not just his false teaching, but his disregard for theology and doctrine. Now, I did a video in the past where Francis pretty much admits to not really caring about doctrine. That doctrine essentially didn't matter to him. And because of that, and in my opinion, is why he's fallen into such heretical ideas and teachings. Now, the next thing he says that sticks out, and this is I this is what I quote. Uh, he says, people are quick to leave churches. Okay. Well, I find that quite hypocritical since he was the one to leave the church he founded with his wife back in the early 2000s. This is a quote from Francis on why he left his church. He says, and I quote, it's kind of diverting some of this, I must hear from Francis notion. By staying at Cornerstone, I felt like I was the cause of the problem, like I wasn't helping the issue. Everything was about Francis Chan, and I felt like I was taking the spotlight away from the church. Well, now personally, I think this was just an excuse he used to be able to step away and do what he wanted to do. Now imagine if every well-known or fa famous reformed pastor had this train of thought. Okay, If someone like John MacArthur thought he was bigger than Grace Church and needed to step away because of that. Okay, that would be ridiculous. I think I would have had more respect for Francis if he just flat out said, there are other things I want to do, and that's why I'm stepping away. So let's continue. Slander. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just, it's so hard when you see Christ's heart for the church mm -hmm. and his heart for oneness that the world hasn't seen. So that, that burdens me. Another thing that burdens me, I think, is... Um, how attached people are to their phones and electric, you know, their devices, mm -hmm. you know, first Peter four, seven, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober minded for the sake of your prayers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we have a generation growing up who 
They've never known what it was like to not be attached and distracted by their electronic devices mm. to be able to pray and be sober minded. Like my mind is clear. I don't go to pray and then there's 30 thoughts that run into my head because I'm going such a fast pace. And But if we really want to see something happen, there needs to be a depth in our prayer lives and our ability to connect with God. And so it burdens me when I see like the busyness of people and unnecessary busyness or I'm just keeping up with all sorts of things. And But <clears throat> on the flip side, it could be that people are coming to the end of those things. I mean, mm. okay, are we so divided that this doesn't even make sense anymore? Everyone's fine with everyone. Um, and And is there just like this sadness to this busyness to where people go, okay, there's got to be something more. It seems to be more of a pursuit of silence. Um, but what I'm most excited, I think, is I see a younger generation that's just going, it's almost like with the ugliness of the world and kind of the sad thought of this country doesn't look like it's heading in the right direction. Uh, this world doesn't seem like it's heading in the right direction. Almost like a losing of that American dream mm -hmm. that maybe I had when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And going, okay, there's really no such thing. And so let me look to something else. And they're actually looking at scripture yes. and go, let me give my life up for this. Um, I feel like there are more young people ready to just go completely biblical mm -hmm. um, rather than like a little dance that we've been doing for for decades. I think about the one of the last times you and I were together, uh, hundreds of I don't know, yeah. 18, 19, 20, 20 year olds and yes. zealous for the word. Yes. Like yes. that morning you and I spoke, like, yeah. I mean, they're, they're just, it, it's not like they're sitting back like, Ew like on the edge of their seat, even standing on their seat, like yeah. open to Romans. They're like, in Romans. Like, they, yeah, 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 yeah. and yes. like praying for hours at a time uh, or that morning. So we, we got there. They were, they were praying and worshiping for hours one night. And then the next morning they got up at like eight o'clock and mm -hmm. got together and prayed for the nations. Yeah. They're praying for all these different. And so I, and from a variety of different backgrounds. Yeah. I just think about exactly like putting those two things together, what you just said, there is a hunger for yeah. one, not the turf wars. Like yeah. it's just, we, we love Jesus. We love his word. Yeah. And, uh, and we've got a variety of differences, but, yeah. but these things the same. And we, uh, I don't know, we were just having lunch totally. with another brother, uh, Andy Bird, uh, who like, we all have differences yeah in a variety of different ways you yeah. know there's a a beautiful yes depth of like family and unity that we were talking about that uh yeah that that is actually the depth is highlighted when we are honest about those differences yes. but we cling to that which yeah. like we love jesus we love the word and we want to get the gospel to the world and we want to see spiritual awakening in our country like yeah um Anyway. So the common theme here, if you've been paying attention, is differences. You've heard both David and Francis hark on this idea that we all believe different, but so what? This is about unity. It's almost as if they're saying, you believe what you want to believe, and we'll believe this, and we can still come together in fellowship. Now, that's bad for a few different reasons. Right now on my channel, I'm working my way through the book of Romans, and we are currently in chapter 3. And one of the prominent points that Paul makes throughout the second and third chapters to the first century religious Jews and this includes the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and so on, was this idea that everything regarding salvation had to do with faith, not circumcision. See, these men all believed different things. They had, you know, different gods. And for them, that was okay. They were able to come together and fellowship with each other, even though they had different views on God and salvation. And that there was the problem for Paul, because Paul declared boldly that there weren't many ways. It was just one way. So whenever I hear David and Francis talk about how we need to come together in love regardless, you know, regardless of what we believe, I'm always reminded that there must be division. 
Okay, and and in the words of the great late theologian R.C. Sproul, truth divides, and it has to. It's supposed to. And so here's the thing. Until both of these men repent and stand firm on biblical truth or stand firm on something, okay, uh, something, they will continue to have this problem that seems to be a burden to them. They know that they're wrong. They know it. And this is why this is such an issue for them. And it bothers them, as it should. So that's my prayer, is that they do repent um, and stand firm and bold on a truth, not a bunch of truths. Uh, now, if you'd like to watch the rest of this discussion, I'll post a link to the, the video in the description description of this video. So thank you for listening. Let's go for another one from cyberspace. Why should we engage in debate since it seems to cause division in the church? What message does that send to those outside the church? God forbid that we should ever debate the truth of the gospel, and that we should ever follow in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, who debated the matter every day in the marketplace, and who wrote all these epistles to correct error and distortions of the truth of God. Weren't those letters that the apostle wrote to the Ephesians and to the Galatians and the Colossians divisive? Nothing divides like truth. Nothing divides like Jesus. But we have this idea that the only real sin that you can have is dividing a church. Well, there are churches that need to be divided. And they need to be divided not over minor matters, not over peccadilloes, but over substantive issues of the truth of God. And our Lord, when he was asked by Pontius Pilate, you know, what are you about? He said, I came to bear witness to the truth. And those who are of the truth hear my voice. And then the next thing Jesus said, but I sure don't want to divide anybody over the truth. <laughs> Thank you for laughing, but it's really not funny. But that's what, I mean, they said the worst thing you can say is, the truth is important, and when you, when you do that, then what happens is the truth gets slain in the streets and anything goes.